horses around my neighborhood and so uh, it, it was just an amazing amazing experience but you know it's funny because I, I asked them and th this might you know give you kind of a clue of what you guys are in for today but you know a couple of minutes ago I said hey Bill I'm gonna do this or we're gonna yeah, I'm gonna come up and introduce you he said he said whatever you need to do I'm here to serve you that's what he said right now just five minutes ago he said I am here to serve you. How, how many times a day, how many times a month do you tell somebody, I am here to serve you? And that's, that's to me, that is Primerica. In a nutshell, that's Primerica. The right way to build a great Primerica business is always be there to serve your people and to help your people win and become successful. And, uh, and this guy did it every step of the way. He did it the right way. And I'm just very proud and pleased to, uh, to, to announce and, and have as our guest speaker today, the great Bill Stewart. Group. I think this is the record for one of my uh, one of my seminars here. Uh, I'm going to start off. This is a presentation I did at MIT. I don't know. Some of you may have been there when I did that uh, MIT or a session ago. And uh, so I want to. Uh, in America, you don't have to be huge to become big. We went through an era in Primerica where people were building huge base shops, 80, 90, 100, 150, but they weren't producing RVPs. And, and that bothered me a little bit because, as I said in the tape, the building block of the movement is producing RVPs. So let's look at this. You create the way. You create the way. This is about today about you and you creating. I used to call the seminar Catch the Wave, but I had to change it because Catch the Wave implies somebody else created it and you get to ride it. This is about you learning to create the way that's going to produce a movement for you. The velocity of the wind and how long it blows has a direct effect on the size of the wave. A short burst of wind that just goes a little bit doesn't produce a big wave. The velocity and of the wind and how long it blows. Your intensity and how long you stay after it has a great deal to do with the size of the wave. Uh, you don't have to be huge to be big. The movement begins with you. You'll hear this said over and over. A movement begins small, gradually increases in size and intensity, and ultimately becomes self-perpetuating if it remains true to its purpose, mission, vision, and values. There was a time in Primerica many years ago, we almost ceased to be a movement. I call it the, in it's happened to most movements in history. I call it the institutionalization of a movement. When the movement becomes, the most dangerous time of movement is not when you're getting started. The most dangerous time is when you become really successful and you stop doing the things that created the movement and you institutionalize. Right. And back when we were a part of some Wall Street companies whose names we don't mention, uh, we were right on the verge of becoming institutionalized. We were losing our heart. We were losing that special spark. Uh, a movement expands only as fast as leadership has developed. That's a quote from the book that many of you have. Okay. Remember these guys in the NBA? They were huge. You know these, Michael Jordan, Hakeem Olajuwon, Carl Malone, Scottie Pippen, Charles... They were the top ten NBA players of the 90s. Now, if you can be huge, if you can be huge, be huge. If you can be in the top ten, be in the top ten. But there's only going to be ten in the top ten. Okay? So if that ain't one of you, then the reality is not everyone can be, but you're a pro. If you're an RVP in Primerica, you're a pro. Hold your head high. You may not be one of those. You might be a Craig Elo. <laughs> okay. Keep going. Okay. Well, here's a story. Uh, when I came to love it as a youth minister in 1975, Craig Elo was in the high school there. I had to shoot baskets with him in the afternoon after school when I was ministering to students. Craig went on to have a 14-year NBA career spanning the 90s. No, not huge, but a pro in every sense of the word. He averaged 8.6 points per game, 3.6 rebounds, 2.8 assists. How many high school and college basketball players would die for that kind of NBA career, right? But he wasn't huge, but he was big. Played in the NBA for 14 years. See, only 10 can be in the top 10. You just be as good as you can be. 
Uh, you can have an awesome American career. How many middle Americans would die for a career where they make seventy five hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars a year and not put somebody else's clock? Right. And, and, and I, had a, I had a young man who was in the real estate business and he said, you know, I'm in the real estate business. I work, I, I've got a great deal of flexibility, but I don't have the freedom you have. Right. See, I have flexibility and freedom. There are a lot of businesses you can have flexibility, but do they give you freedom? Not if all the income depends on you. But when you build a movement, then you can have freedom. Uh, okay, splitting the atom. The phenomenon that atoms can be split led to the atomic bomb and nuclear power plants. In a bomb, the chain reaction happens very rapidly, and there's a powerful explosion. In, in a nuclear power plant, the release of energy is slower and more controlled. Either way, it produces a lot of energy. You may be a real fast mover. Great, go explode. But if you're not an explosive leader, be a consistent power plant. You still produce the energy in the leader. Just be who you are. Okay, the power of your movement is in producing RVPs. The base shop's a spawning ground for that. You're going to see this later. This is a uh, world leadership segment. We're not just producing leaders for Primeric. We're producing leaders for the world. And you take the segment and you put together a bunch of segments and you have a movement. We'll talk about that more. And we'll cover this more. I had to touch on this at MIT. I had 15 minutes to speak today. I've got longer than that. Uh, but, and I mentioned I have a four-hour seminar, which, hey, well, that's what you're at, the four-hour seminar, teaching how to build a movement. Okay. Bill who? Maybe you can build who? Okay. I got married two weeks out of high school. I met this girl when she was a freshman. I saw her. I remember when she walked in the room. I know exactly where she was standing. I know in my mind exactly what she had on. And I fell in love with her. I was kind of shy. A year later, once I got my driver's license, I asked her for a date on February 1964. She said yes. And I thought, I'm kind of wise. You know, as long as she says yes, I'll never have to ask anybody else. So I just kept asking her. She said yes. She's the only girl I ever dated. We, we dated all through high school, but we knew it wasn't mature to get married right out of high school, so we waited two weeks. <laughs> and that would, be, that would be 47 years this Woo! summer. Five kids, 12 years and uh, one great grandchild now. Awesome. I never graduated college. In fact, over a 10 year period, I had completed two semesters of freshman English. I took my first semester of freshman English at Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches, Texas in 1966. I was a part-time student. I took my second semester of freshman English in 1976 at Texas Tech. Somebody gave me a calculator. I got it out and said, you're not going to live long enough to finish college at that rate anyway. So you better find something else to do. Uh, at age 30, I woke up at age 30 with five kids. I actually went to bed that night. I had five kids. I woke up the next morning had five kids. But I was 30 years old. Uh, no college. I grew up in a violent alcoholic family. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I was working 40 or 50 hours a week and going to school. And I did that all through my high school career. I had to. That's just the way my life was. I wouldn't want a kid to have to do that, but it didn't kill me. Okay. Uh, two months before Sarah and I got married, she took, asked me to take her to a movie, and it was a Billy Graham movie. If I'd known that's what it was, I wouldn't have gone. Because I grew up in East Texas, a farm community. I believe in God. Never, never did I not believe in God, I just didn't think he cared about me, and I wasn't real interested in him. But I went to that movie, the reason I didn't walk out on it, because I had five bucks invested in two movie tickets, two large popcorns, and two large tickets. Well, what do you like that? But I was also working for 75 cents an hour, so I had an eight-hour day invested in that ticket, too, so I didn't walk out. My life was changed forever that night. And, uh, but at age 30, so I, I was in ministry, at age 30, Five kids, I'd never made over $10,000 a year in my life. My, I was the only income. My wife, with five kids under the age of 11, she had her hands full at home. We couldn't afford a daycare anyway. So there I was when Mike Tuttle came to see me, and he shared some things that made a difference in my life. And he lived 350 miles away in uh, Dallas, Texas. I, he, had, he actually attended a little church that I went to in Lubbock, and then he moved shortly after that. And he got the business, came back and shared with me, and then he went back to Dallas, and I started telling people what he did for me, and they said, man, we need him, we need some help. Can he come talk to us? And I said, I, I, no, I'm sorry, he lives in Dallas. Can't you get him to come out here? So I called Mike and said, Mike, I got five families, can you come out? 350 miles, he'd come out. A month later, Mike, I got six families, can you come out? A month later, after about four trips, he looks at me and says, Bill, I used to live in Lubbock. That's where we met, remember? If I wanted to spend my life in Lubbock, I would <laughs> 
I ain't moving, so you got two choices. Shut up. Quit telling people what I did for you or get in the business of helping yourself. And I'm like, me in the business? Mike, I don't know anything about what you do. He said, don't even go there. Every time I go to a family's dining room table with you and I start talking, they just look at me and they go, Bill told us all about it. You just do for us what you did for him. I said, okay, well, the second thing is I'm not ready to leave my ministry. You don't have to, Bill. You can do it part-time. So I did it part-time for about nine months. I was making $900 a month as a youth minister, working 60 hours a week. That's 240 hours a month. I started doing this business 20 hours a month, making $1,000 a month. Still took me nine months to figure out. 20 hours a month equals 1,000. 240 equals 900. So I did a little addition. I said, you know what? I can do 40 hours of each one. They said, I'll still put in 40 hours a a week as a youth minister, I put 40 hours in this business, once 80 hours for a country boy, I mean, or a business owner, so I did that. So for the next two years, I pretty much continued my ministry, except after a couple of months, I told them not to pay me, because my first full year in the business in Primerica, I made $42,000. I'd never made over $10,000 a year in my life. I was 31 years old. Here's what I thought. I thought, my gosh, if this company figures out they're paying this dude, I mean, where I came from, grew up with violent alcoholic family, was in trouble all the time, never went to college. They're going to shut me off. Nobody's going to pay me that kind of money. Primerica never promised me I'd make a penny, but they promised me they'd never put a lid on my income. They never promised me I'd recruit anybody, but they promised me I could recruit and build and be as big as I wanted to be. So that was me. So I spent my entire 34-year career in Lubbock, Texas. I started an upstairs bedroom part-time. Here's my production record. Don't laugh. My one-month personal production record, 2,369. Danny's going back to you. Oh. I got part timers do more than that, Danny says. My one month base shop record, 40,000. I promoted two RVPs that month. Was I huge? No. Am I big? Yes, 644 RVPs, 15,000 rest. My one month hierarchy production record, 5.8. Who cares what my personal production record was? Who cares what my base shop production record was? I have a hierarchy that does $6 million a month. In production because I built a movement. What I want to talk to you about today, okay, the size of your movement is measured by the number of your multiplying RVPs. Your objective is not a huge base shop. Your objective is to build a movement. Build a movement, you need a solid, strong, consistent base shop producing solid, strong, consistent RVPs who are producing solid, strong, consistent RVPs. Here's my definition of a solid, strong RVP. Has a strong, stable income, makes and saves money, writes good business, builds good relationships, and produces strong leaders. Can be different numbers for different people. I, I, I know people can live in less money in Lubbock, Texas than they can in this part of California, okay? I know that. Because I've got, uh, we're selling the place that we live for 28 years. We're downsizing to five acres. People say, downsizing to five acres, yeah. Because 83 acres is a lot when, when uh, Five acres is not much of been living on 83. And you would laugh if I told you what we're selling our 83 acres in the house for. It's selling for right at $800,000. 5,100 square foot house, enclosed swimming, heated swimming pool. We bought the five acres with a motorhome barn, a horse barn, pipe fences all around it for $422,000. Now, I, I sh you know, i got to quit saying that because people don't want to start moving to Lubbock, Texas. I <laughs> It is dirty. There are no trees. There are no hills. Uh, we had the worst dirt storm we've had in 30 years. The dirt blew for eight solid hours. I had to pull off the road because I couldn't see the front of, front of my pickup. We just had just had a 26 car pile up eight miles north of where I was driving. All of a sudden, I couldn't see the front of my pickup, and I just drove off the road. Because I started to slam on my brakes, and I thought, wait a minute, if I slam on my brakes and somebody's behind me, they're going to hit me. But if I don't slam on my brakes and somebody's in front of me, I, so I, I drive a pickup, so I just drove it off the road into the cotton field. There you go. And I said, there's there going to be a wreck, I ain't going to be in it. Okay. Uh, the movement begins with you. Okay, we've got that down. Now, let's, uh, let's uh, go to my main presentation. Okay, you had the opportunity to get the book. You don't have to have the book, but let, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Let me say this, you guys are way ahead of most places that I do this because Danny and the team here, y'all have some incredible systems. Y'all have some incredible systems, you have some techniques, you have some tools. A lot of people are still searching for that. 
What we're talking about today is not techniques and tools. I'm not going to tell you to change anything you're doing. This is about principle. Uh, an air, I used to fly an airplane. In, uh, airplanes fly on the law of uh, aerodynamics. You can have a little bitty single engine Cessna 152. You can have a twin engine. You can have a 747 jet. You can have one of those big giant Boeing deals that carries hundreds of people. But they all fly on the same principle. And you can have a finely tuned uh, airplane. And if you don't understand the principles of aerodynamics, you can kill yourself in it. Airplanes are meant to fly, not drive. I used to start running out flying the old Cessna 150, and it had a rotation speed of 65 miles an hour. Do so you get that in going down the runway? When it hits 65 miles an hour, uh, the wind goes over the wing at that speed. It creates a vacuum. That's the law of aerodynamics. And then the air pressure underneath lifts the plane. At 64, it'll never lift. I could get in that plane, drive it to California at 64 miles an hour. But driving a plane is tough to do. A lot harder than driving a car. Driving a plane is like trying to fly a car. It ain't made to drive. I mean, it doesn't steer good, and you're just, you're, you gotta. So, but can you imagine how funny it would look to see a plane going down a freeway? Simply because the guy didn't understand if you went one more mile an hour faster, the law of aerodynamics would take into effect, and you'd actually lift off. What I'm talking about today are principles. Principles that, that you have to understand to build a movement. So what this allows you to do, it allows you to, uh, let me see where we're at, okay. It allows you to understand how to apply those principles. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the book. Doug Hartman wrote the book, Doug Hartman and Doug Sutherland. A disclaimer, I make no money off the book, Doug Hartman makes no money off the book. I do pay Doug Sutherland, who is a minister here in Southern California, He's not in Prime America. I pay him a royalty off the sale of each one of his books, which is the right thing to do. The other thing you might notice, if you looked on the back and you saw the price that said $8.95, and you're wondering, why the heck did I pay $12 then? Okay. <laughs> First of all, this book was published in the middle 70s. That was the price in the middle 70s. We just reprinted it with the same cover. So if you don't like the current price, I'll just take $8.95 and apply a little bit of inflation to it. It's a small inflation rate, like 3%, rule of 72, doubles every, eight, every 18 years, right? So 1975 to 1993, it would go to $17, and then it would go to $34. So if you don't like the $12 discounted price, we'll sell it to you at the inflation-adjusted price of $34. <laughs> But I didn't want that just because in Crown America, we don't go around and do seminars to make money. Uh, and, and that $12 included shipping the books out here, included printing the deals, and it included years of storage because I now have, have 5,000 copies of this book in my barn. So back then when they were reprinted, they didn't have the systems today where you can... They print the book as people order. Like my book that I have on my website that I wrote, it's a crazy little book, but... I'm not get, but anyway, this, so I've got those. That's a good deal, and that's the disclaimer there. Doug Hartman wrote this book. They wrote this book in the middle 70s. It was written for ministry, okay? It was written for ministry. It says on the back, if you consider what it takes to be a leader in today's fast-paced world. I laugh when I read that. 1975 was fast-paced? <laughs> well, we thought it was, but we look back and we think, oh man, those were the good old slow days of 1975. Uh, but what about today? Have you ever wished you could get your life better organized and succeed? Daniel, that's life. It doesn't say desk. It doesn't say room. It doesn't say closet. It says get your life better organized uh, to succeed. Uh, the, the difficult thing about my wife and I buying this new place is uh, it was already built. We loved the house, but it only had one big walk-in closet. We've always had two. Hers looked like a showcase at a high-dollar department store with everything organized. Mine looked like a, a, a Texas Tech laboratory for the study of tornadoes. <laughs> and the big question we had was, are we going to be able to share a closet? So before we bought it, we even sketched out a place that we could build an extra closet if we needed it. But it's going pretty good. We've been there four months now, and I haven't been kicked out of the closet yet. Uh, do you feel you've never reached your highest potential in any of your character or your career? See, Primerica is just about growing a business, about growing people. It's about developing your character. Uh, would you like for your life to make a difference for those people you come in contact with? Now, I know that everybody in the world wants their life to count for something. Everybody says a little deal down inside the heart says, I want to I, I make a difference while I'm here. 
I, I just want to I want to make a difference. If, if if somebody asked me what do you want on your tombstone if there's one, I just put he made a difference. Or in West Texas verbiology, he rocked the boat. <laughs> you know, they knew he was here. Okay. Now, what I've done, and let me tell you a story about this book. I used the principles of this book in our ministry. Uh, in 1969, I joined Campus Crusade for Christ when we were assigned to Atlanta, Georgia to help launch a ministry with high school students, okay? And uh, I, we were there for a couple of years, and then the leader said, we want you and your family to move to Houston. We want you to start a ministry in Houston. Here are the names of two students that went to one of our summer high school conferences. So I packed up, left Atlanta, Georgia, took my wife and two little babies, and we moved to Houston, Texas. We had the names of two students. Kind of like somebody giving you the names of somebody. And, the, and so that's where we started. But we had the principles of this book. And uh, one of those students, by the way, uh, she's been a Wycliffe Bible translator for over 30 years now. I've uh, been in China, been in the Solomon Islands, been in the former Ukraine. Amazing story. But we went to Houston and we took the principles of this book. The book wasn't even written yet, but we understood the principles. We were teaching them. Doug was teaching them in a seminar like this to our staff around the country. And uh, four years later, we had over 2,300 students and 16 full-time staff members involved in our ministry. So when I went to, to, from Houston to Lubbock, Texas, this little church, we were doing the same thing. And then when I met Mike Tuttle and I saw A.L. Williams, I went to my first A.L. Williams meeting, the amazing thing I realized, you know what, Bill? You can just lay the principles in this book right down on the A.L. Williams Primerica Company, and you can use those same principles. I understood the night I joined, the night I made a commitment to become a part of A.L. Williams, I could see in my mind, Daniel, having an organization with tens of thousands of people in it. What I didn't understand is what that would translate into money, and if I had of it, it would have probably scared me so much, I would have run the other way and said, hey, anybody pay a guy like this that kind of money, you're either, you're either lying that you say you will, or you're doing something illegal that says you could. You know, because you just, but I understood those principles. And so we've applied these throughout the years. And... Um, uh, this book was written, at, 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 it's, I don't know if it's out of print, but it has a chapter in it about Doug Harmon. It's called The, the, the uh, True Entrepreneur is the name of the book. And I bought the book one time because it had a chapter about Doug and his business in it. But it says this, the great majority of Americans belong to the group we call survivors. Survivors are good, honest, hardworking people. They show up at their jobs every day, obey the laws, pay their taxes, raise families, rest, recreate, do odd jobs on the weekend. Sadly, however, Many survivors, as they drive the jobs that no longer provide a challenge or any hope of significant advancement, often hear an insistent internal voice whispering, isn't there something more than this out there for me? Well, my entire life consists of this tedious struggle of earning term dollars. Why do I never seem to make enough money? Why does it seem that no matter how hard I try, I'm never truly satisfied with my life? You know how when you go down a freeway out here? Yeah. That's what's going on in people's minds. Yeah. That's what's going on in a lot of your minds. That's why you're here. Okay, See, these people are stuck in a bad place. It's called the comfort zone. Uh, and despite its title, it's true, it isn't truly a comfortable place to be. Individuals caught in the comfort zone usually experience a nagging level of unhappiness because they know they're not experiencing, exercising their true potential. The personal comfort zone is the natural human tendency to settle into a secure, comfortable form of mediocrity which envelops our dream of something better and ultimately silences them altogether. Most people believe that failure and discouragement are the great dampers of dreams, but they're wrong. The personal comfort zone is the single most pernicious killer of dreams that exist. Now, the way I would illustrate if I was in West Texas, I just forego all that fancy talk and I'd say he did. Joe walked into the feed store one day and he told Bob he needed three, three sacks of horse mule feed and he looked over there and there was Joe's dog leaning up against the wall going, He said, uh, Bob said, Joe, what's wrong with your dog? Nothing. Joe, something's wrong with your dog. No, he just... Laying on a nail sticking up through the floor. <laughs> well, why don't he move? Well, he ain't uncomfortable enough yet. <laughs> you hear those whines going on from people around you in your life? Maybe if you're part-time at the job you're working at, whining, whining, why don't they move? Why don't they come into Primerica? They're either stupid or they're just not uncomfortable enough yet. Okay? One of those two things. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, let's talk, a, let me back up here and talk a little, I, I mentioned this, by the way, this is not a, a once read book, this is a manual. I read this book a minimum of one time a year for the first 25 years I was in the business, often two or three times a year. It is like an operator's manual. If things aren't going right in your business, 
you're doing all the right techniques, you've got all the right systems down, but you're just not moving. I would sit down and I would evaluate my business in terms of the principles in this book to find out where I needed to make adjustments. Was I, on, was I exercising the right principle? My plane is not flying, or it's not flying at the altitude I want it to fly on. What, it's like an air, a manual for an airplane. What do I need to do? So it's not the kind of book, if, if you want to take advantage of it, it's not the kind of book you read, put it up on your shelf. You keep it handy. You refer to it. I'm in the process right now of setting up, I thought I'd have it done, but I'm not that good at that. Marin, but I'm setting up a, a website called Create, Create the Wave, or Create a Wave. I think we're going to go back and change it dot something or other. I'm not going to tell you what the dot is because we don't have it open yet, but it's going to be a place where you can go back to and review. Like if you're, gonna, if you're studying this and you're okay, now what was Bill saying about that? You'll be able to go back and review these principles because it, it's not something you just get one time. I promise you, it is not. So let's talk about, let's introduce the book a little bit. Okay. Uh, first of all, there's the introduction. Um, or there's there's chapter one. Well, let, let's take a look at the introduction and the book. Look at the table of contents. There's four parts of the book. Part one become and, and I, I I use the word leader. The book uses the word disciple. I use the word leader here. Becoming a multiplying leader. Okay. And we're going to talk about you becoming a multiplying leader. The second part is selecting other people that you're going to develop into multiplying leaders. Everybody you recruit is not going to become a multiplying leader. You learn to determine who is it you're going to identify as that person that wants to become a multiplying leader so you can start really focusing on them and pouring your life into them. The third part is the development of that multiplying leader. And the fourth part is developing a movement. You can't develop the movement without the development of multiplying leaders. You can't develop multiplying leaders until you've identified those people who want to be multiplying leaders. And you can't identify those people who want to be a multiplying leader until you determine you want to be a multiplying leader. Chapter 1, we don't cover here, but I will tell you this. If I had an opportunity to sit down with you, just me and you, over a cup of coffee and just talk about life and talk about what I believe to be the single most important thing in my life or anybody's life, it would be chapter 1. So at some time, just sit down when you've got a quiet moment and read through chapter 1 and think about your life. If you have any questions about that, you can contact me. Uh, I want to start where we're going to end up. Turn, if you have the book, turn in the book to... Uh, back over to page uh, 149. We're going to start where we're going to wind up. Now my wife likes to do this. She, she, she'll buy a novel and she'll read the end of it. <laughs> I'm like, why would you read the rest of the novel if you know how it's going to turn out? I mean, I, she said, because it's, I, just, I like the, the flow of stuff, the story. I just want to know how it's going to turn out. You know, if I know how it's like, she walks in, I'm watching a TV show. I say, you, you want me to stop? She said, no, I don't mind seeing the end of it. I'll go back and watch the rest of it later. <laughs> but, but on this part, it's good. Turn to page 149. There are a set of paradoxes here. What I want you to see here. Primerica is the perfect company in existence to apply these principles in. If you took these principles to your job and tried to apply these, most likely it would be like taking the law of aerodynamics and trying to apply it to an 18-wheeler. Their structure just ain't designed to incorporate and, and make these things work. So let's look at this. The, this method of leadership uh, has some very exciting concepts. For instance, number one, the leadership process is very personal, but it's very large. That's a paradox. Because there are people that their attitude is, oh, I just I love people. Let's just get us four no more. Let's just have a nice little group. We'll love each other. We'll help a few families. It'll just be us four no more. And then there's other people who say, I want the numbers. I want the numbers. I don't care how many people I have to step on to get them. I'm going to go get them. So it's very personal. There's strong personal relationships, but it can still be very large. The second one. This leadership process gives an individual tremendous freedom. But freedom without controls is chaos. Freedom without controls is chaos. Uh, controls without freedom is a cadaver. Okay? That's why a lot of businesses are just dead places. Everything's controlled, but there's no freedom. Uh, I, I used to share this with my kids. I just want some freedom, Dad. I'm 13 years old. I'm 14 years old. I want some freedom. 
I said, let me show you what, let me show you what total freedom's worth. Take your kite out in the backyard and let's fly it. Take this pair of scissors with you. That kite doesn't have a whole lot of restraints on it. Cut the string and see what happens to the kite. You cut the string of that kite, it crashes every time. We're not made to be totally free. We're made to be free with certain restraints and controls that allow us to, to, to reach the full potential of our freedom. Okay? And so, number uh, yet it's very controlled. And that's what our training, our guidelines, and our structures do. Number three, this leadership process is designed to find and train multiplying leaders. Yet, a place for everyone is created. Hey, point. Everybody's not going to be a leader. As much as you want them to be. But you know what? If they're good people and they're helping people, I want them to be welcome. I have a lady in Lubbock that was part-time with us for 25 years. I want her to be full-time. She didn't. She was a single mom. She had a corporate position. She had all the benefits and everything. She just could never take the risk. 25 years. She has hundreds and hundreds of families. She retired from a 30-year career with her other company, and her residual income from 25 years part-time in Primerica was 50% greater than her retirement from 30 years with the other company. Okay? Hey. Can you build a movement with that? No, but I'd like to have had a hundred people like her in my face shot. You bet I would. She felt welcome. She never felt intimidated or let. See, so that's the paradox. It's a place to find and train and develop leaders, but it's a place where everybody has a place to fit in. And that's really important. Okay, number four. Uh, this leadership process produces an effective leader in our business, yet the objective is the world. I'm not just about... Primerica, I want to change the world. I know that if I impact a person's life in Primerica, they become a better person, a stronger leader, a more confident person, a stronger character. They're going to make a better husband or father. They're going to make a better wife or mother. They're going to make a better church member. They're going to make a better leader in their community. They're going to make a difference in the world, not just in the business. Number five, this leadership process emphasizes a well-organized procedure well, this is a tough one because the second one there depends on the Holy Spirit. So I had to kind of move that so we're not in a spiritual religion. It depends on, on the freedom of the human spirit. You have the freedom to be who you are and to be motivated by what motivates you. Okay? Yet, we have a, 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 a well-organized procedure, but you've got the freedom to move through that according to who you are and where you are. Number six, this leadership process has two definite objectives. The first is find and select multiplying leaders. The second is to use to accomplish personal objectives. This is so important. I remember when I first, the first uh, AO Williams meeting I ever went to in Atlanta, Georgia in 1978, Presidential Hotel, and one of the guys was speaking. He said, we're looking for people who want to use us to help them reach their objectives. Yes, as a leader, you have objectives. You have team objectives, production things. But the ultimate bottom line is, can I show you how this will help you get out of life what you want out of life? Not how can you help me have huge production, not how you can help me win a contest, not how you can help me get a promotion. How can I serve you? How can I help you get what you need? And they talked about this guy. He said, let me, he said, we had this guy, man, we recruited him, and he heard us say that, and he got in the business, he did great for about six to nine weeks. Just, man, he was making sales, and then he just disappeared. And so we went and found him. He said, man, you, you got started. So he said, look, you said you were looking for people that wanted to use you to help them reach their objectives. He said, I had an objective in life, and that was to own a color TV. I got that baby. I'm staying home and watching it. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought for a minute, well, and then, and then the guy went on. I got great confidence in the company. He said, we are presently working with the guy to try to have him, help him have a higher objective in life than owning a color TV. <laughs> but the principle was still there. See, once he got what he wanted, but you, and some people, they don't understand what... You know, their wants are very small because they never had anything, so you have to keep challenging. That's one of the things you'll learn today. Okay. Um, number seven, the leadership process has a definite procedure, yet it produces a person who's independently dependent. Yeah, but you got a team. People have to work together. That's the coach. But one day we want you to be the head coach. Then you get to call the plays. You get to send in the plays. You get to decide the offense. Now, can you learn from the great coaches you've had? Yes. But you don't have to exactly duplicate them. You can take all the things you've learned from them and tweak them, and you've got your own unique, your own unique style. You see that in the coaching field all the time. 
guys that grew up under coaches and then became assistant coaches under those guys and then went out to be their own coaches. And yes, they brought a lot of the deals, but they weren't just an exact replica of that person. Right? They had their own unique coaching styles. Okay, now, uh, number nine, uh, number eight, the, the process used to build uh, effects in multiplying leaders, and yet leadership, it produces leadership for the world. And we've talked about that. Number nine, page 152. The leadership process allows an individual to be well-trained and developed. I love this one. And yet, the average person can do it. The average person can do it. Hey, I'm the guy they put on the stage and they say, look, see this guy? If he can do it, you can. <laughs> I mean, none of you came from any t probably didn't come from any tougher home background he came from. Most of you didn't start working 40 or 50 hours a week when you were 13 years old. My brother and I went to a bank without, a, without an adult signature, borrowed money. I don't know how they did that. Maybe the banker just signed it himself. Borrowed money to buy a truck, start our own business when I was 15 and he was 16. And with, on a good day, we can make $100 a day with that truck. Now, for two teenage kids in 1964, 65, $100 a day, that's pretty dead good and good money. Now, we didn't make that every day, but I just mean, you know, now, would I want a kid to have to do that? No. There's better ways to live your life. But we had to do it. That's where we work. And, and uh, um, so, if I can do it, you got to understand, if I can do it, you can do it. And that's what I love about this business. In fact, I see people all the time. And I don't care who they are when they tell me what to do. I said, well, I kind of do that. I met this guy's home remodeler. I said, you know, that's kind of the business I'm in. I remodel people's financial homes. Uh, guy's an auto mechanic. Well, our business is kind of like what you do. People bring in their financial vehicle. It's all messed up. We fix it up and tune it up. Uh, I have a guy that's a waiter. Uh, you know, our business kind of, I mean, you'd be good at our business because we kind of do what you do. We found out what people want and we help them get it. You know? And, uh, and I, I just kind of opens the door for conversations with people. And then I can use to say, you know what? I can teach you how to do my business a lot quicker than you can teach me how to do yours. I guarantee you I can teach an auto mechanic how to do this quicker than he can teach me how to be an auto mechanic. I guarantee you a guy can remodel. Because I remember I still had the frame frozen picture in my mind when I was a sophomore. And I was in wood shop and my teacher stood up in front of the class, had my project in his hand. Now, start over. This was in Texas. Old Sturt over there, he ain't got a clue what a square is for. <laughs> and he proceeded to take a square and put it up to every cut on my wood project, and there wasn't a single square cut. <laughs> and, uh, and then in, in an auto shop, that when we were doing the auto shop section, we had to tear apart a little lawnmower engine and put it back to work. So I got mine all back together, and I had three bolts left over. <laughs> And I see this hole in the middle of the engine with this little thing that goes up and down, and I just drop them in there on top of that and put the cover back on. <laughs> so I got mine put together, and we'll see if it'll crank. Now it's making funny noises, but it will <laughs> So I promise you, when you meet people, if you're like me, I can teach you my business quicker than you can teach me yours. Okay, let's start off with, uh, let's get started in the book then. Uh, You've got some outlines. I put these outlines. And what I did is I was reading the set of outlines. I took all the terminology and relabeled it, you know, so that it's, it's primarily terminology rather than the ministry terminology that's in the book. First thing that a person has to ask when you're building a movement, if you're going to be the leader, is what's in it for you? Uh, there are two types of leaders. On page 19, there's a leader by position, a leader by influence. That's nothing new. You'll hear guys like... What's his name that talks about this a lot? John Maxwell. Uh, John Maxwell. Yeah, 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 John Maxwell. That's who I was trying to think of. Uh, leaders by influence and leaders by position. Leader by position is your boss at job. He may not be as smart as you, may, but he's got the position. you got to do what he tells you to do. Leader by influence is a, pe a person who people follow because of the influence they have on them. If you know where you're going, you know why you're here, you know where you're going, you know how to get there, and you're moving forward, people will follow you because people are hungry for leadership. People want somebody that will take them somewhere in life. So what are the benefits? The benefits of becoming a multiplying leader. What are those benefits? Let me get my notes. You know, I, I taught this whole seminar up in Tennessee one time. And when it was through, Danny, I kind of said, something just didn't seem right. I don't know what it was. Something about that whole session today. And I had left my, I'd never, I'd let, 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 I didn't even bring my notes with me. And I kept 
then didn't realize until the session was over that I didn't even refer to my notes, so, okay. Character, personal character, the single most important ingredient for success, true success. I'm not talking about just money in the bank. A lot of people in America got money in the bank and they ain't got no character. They ain't got no personal integrity. I'm talking about true leadership and true success. The single most important ingredient is, is, is your own personal integrity. And, uh, and, your, and your strength of character. And we help people do that. We, we're in a, a company that believes in that. We believe in doing the right thing. We don't believe in making decisions just to make commissions. We believe in always doing what's right. Let me tell you, most companies aren't structured that way. Most companies aren't. There's an atmosphere. And, and that's why one of the biggest problems we have many times in primaries when we hire somebody who's been in professional sales for 20 or 25 years. Because they just got this whole deal, you do whatever it takes to make the sale. And they come in here and they just doesn't work, folks. And so we help people do that. The result, your inner confidence. You decide you want to be a multiplying leader and you start submitting yourself to the environment and the people that help you become that, you develop inner confidence. And with inner confidence, you're more confident with people. You express yourself better. People have more confidence in you because they sense you have confidence in yourself. Uh, wisdom. Now, now wisdom, it's often said, wisdom is the result of experience. And experience is usually the result of lack of wisdom. I look at most of my experiences in life came because I didn't exercise a lot of wisdom in my choices I made. But if I learned from them, then I grew in wisdom, right? So, uh, and then positive attitude. A positive attitude. And there's something about a positive attitude. Just believing the best, hoping the best, encouraging people with the best. But remember, you can't control results. I don't care how positive you are. You cannot control results. You can affect results by creating the atmosphere, but you can't control the results. Uh, positive attitude, positive action, and positive achievement. But you still can't control the results. Uh, when we were at, with Campus Crusade, we used to have this saying that said, successful witnessing is taking the initiative to share Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. I remember I had a guy on my team one time years back, he just how can people say no to this? I mean, look, they had fifty thousand dollars for the insurance. For half the premium, I was going to give them two hundred, and they said no. Well, I said, I don't know. I said, people say no to good things. And I remember telling, I said, look, I spent most of my life telling people how they can get to heaven. That's a pretty good deal. So I turned the best of heaven's good, heaven's better, and they still tell me no. no. And I just, it's a gift. You just have to receive it. No. I said, if they can turn heaven down, I think they can turn down by turn the best of the difference. Because he used it. Uh, the other benefit to you is bu business building. Danny, Danny talks about that new book, that uh, personal MBA. That's what you get here. I meet college students all the time. Big university town, love the kids. And I'll meet a college student and they'll come in and I'll say, look, I don't know what your life holds for you. I don't know whether this would be a lifetime thing for you. No, we don't. But you need to be in Primerica now. Because everything you learn in Primerica will make you a better person no matter what you do with your life. You'll learn how money works. You'll learn business skills. You'll learn personal discipline. You'll learn leadership skills. You'll be mentored by successful people. You'll learn self-confidence. You'll learn public speaking. You'll learn all these things. So whatever you do in your life now, I said, I hope you make primary career, but if you don't, you're going to be more valuable. And all of that, all of that, all of that for less than the price of one college textbook. Much less a college degree. You get all that for less than the price of one college textbook. So you got nothing to lose. So you need to fill out that IBA today, and you need to start growing as a person. And building business, participating in changing lives. You heard me say on the video, uh, and, and I've seen this over the years. People burn out. I've seen people literally burn out on recruiting. You say, you know what? I'm just going to be a producer. I'm going to get a lot of securities business going. I'm just not going to recruit a lot of people. Because they recruit people, they pour their life into them, and then they, they leave. And, they just, and, and that's where I came up with the phrase, if you're recruiting just to build your business, you're in danger of burnout. But if you're recruiting to impact lives, you're going to impact them where they say, if they're just around people like you a little bit, I'm telling you, I know the kind of people you are, because I know the kind of leaders Danny and Carmen and, and, and the different people out here are. And if people are just around your team for a little bit, their lives are going to be impacted positively. And maybe, I, I remember one time, we had a young man work for their business, and then uh, he went off to that. And I remember Sharon and I were going to a football game one day. Texas Tech football game, we were walking across the street, going to the stadium, Bill, hey Bill, Sarah, hey Bill, Sarah. I looked back and, and there was a young man and he said, I just had to say hi to y'all. I said, 
Man, I just want to thank y'all. You know, when y'all found me, I was just a, a, a little retail clerk at Cardinal Sporting Goods. But he said, I, and, and y'all got me in Prime America, and I learned so much. He said, I still got my term insurance, still, still doing my mutual fund. But my dream had always been to own my own chain of sporting goods stores. And he said, see all these booths around here selling all this Texas tech gear? Those are mine. That's right. Those are mine. And I got three stored now. Awesome. Now, you know what? I would have loved it if he had been an RVP. But I was excited for him. We were the bridge that helped him go in life for what he wanted. I was just as excited for him as if he'd become an RVP. Now, it didn't mean as much to me financially, but that's not what I'm about. I'm about helping people get where they want to go. And so that, that's a powerful thing. Fulfill your life's purpose, mission, and vision. There have been times over the year where I've had to stop and say, okay, Bill, you know what your purpose is. And I think every person ought to have a purpose statement and a mission. A lot of people just focus on mission statements. But a mission without a purpose is misery. That's why most people at work are miserable. They have a mission. They know what they have to do every day. But it doesn't relate to any purpose. Then I've met other people. Oh, I've got this great purpose. I have purpose. What are you doing about it? Well, well nothing yet. But I've got this great purpose. Okay? A purpose without a mission is powerless. But a mission without a purpose is misery. So I like to have a purpose. Like I have a purpose statement. That's why I'm here. Why am I taking up space on the planet? Why am I breathing the air? Okay, my purpose. Uh, and, and as a believer, I preface it this way. If you're not a believer, you can leave the first part out. But my purpose is to the glory of God, I exist to serve by sharing truth. I got this from a book, by, I'll, I'll give you the name of it later, by Kevin McCarthy called The On Purpose Person, The On Purpose Business. I'll give that information later. But he said, and he said, you know, if you're not a believer, just put I exist to serve and then find your Jerry. And I remember when I read that, I told Sarah, I said, where's the pet store? Where's the pet store? She said, why? I said, man, I'm reading this book, and I've got to go get one of them little animals that runs around the cage, one of the little gerbil deals. Bill, what is getting a gerbil? The little guy says, i got to have one. She said, what are you talking about? I said, right. Bill, that's a gerund, not a gerbil. <laughs> a gerund is a verb ending in ing. Sharing, teaching, inspiring, encouraging. What is your gerund? What is it that inspires your heart? When you're doing that, you just know you're in the zone. Encouraging somebody. Inspiring somebody. Helping somebody. Teaching somebody. Mine is sharing. I exist to serve by sharing truth. That's my purpose. Now my mission, what am I going to do about that? My mission then is to share truth that sets people free spiritually, emotionally, and financially. I was set free spiritually when I became a Christian at Billy Graham movie but not emotionally. I was raised in a violent, violent, alcoholic family. When a child grows up in that kind of environment, their emotions are shut down. They never learn how to develop an emotional relationship with their parents, which is where a child learns to develop an emotional relationship. So I, so I didn't have that. So I grow up. I get married. I love, I, I love my wife. I love my kids, but I cannot connect with them emotionally. And I don't know why. I don't know why. It's just... It's not there. I don't even understand it. I went to a prim I was at an A.O. Williams meeting, Prime American meeting, years ago in Las Vegas. And we it was going through some troubled waters as it, as it has at different times. And one of my friends had been in the business a long time. He came and said, how are you doing in all this, Bill? I said, I'm smiling on the outside, man. He said, oh, the old AOCA smile. I said, what? He said, the AOCA smile. I said, oh, he said, the adult children of alcoholic smile. You're dying on the inside, but you're smiling on the outside. I said, he said, you were, you were raised in an alcoholic family, weren't you? I said, you got a mirror? He said, like, on my forehead? I mean, <laughs> he said, no. He said, I was too. And over I, the past few years, and I've known you, I see some of those same characteristics that I had. And he said, I got a book that changed my life. He, gave, he told, told me the name of the book, Adult Children of Alcoholics by Janet Wotis, W-O-T-I-T-Z. I didn't even go in the meeting. I walked out of the hotel because he struck a chord. I walked out of the hotel and went to a bookstore and bought the book. And then came back to the meeting. And that book was a life changer because I realized there was a reason. What, if there was a reason I was the way I was, then there was a solution to the way I was. And that was the beginning of an incredible emotional hit. I spent 15 years of my life physiologically unable of shedding a tear. I was just shut down. Now, 
I get very emotional. I cry when they say goodnight at the 10 o'clock news. <laughs> I mean, I'm very emotional. I don't apologize for it because I've spent too many years of my life not being that way. That's why I'm, I'm about sharing truth that sets people free emotionally. And then, of course, financially. 30 years old, five kids, $900 a month, no college, no nothing. I needed some financial freedom. So that's why I wake up every day 35 years later excited because it's about fulfilling my purpose, my mission, my vision. Okay. Personal character, single most ingredient deal for success. Okay, that's chapter one. Now, what I'm doing is, I'm, I'm, as I go through this book, I am covering the diagrams at the end of the book. If you decide later on, if you don't have a book and you're thinking, you know, this might be a worthwhile investment, uh, there'll still be some out there you can get. Uh, and um, so let's go to, let me see if I... Um, okay. Observation. Now, this is not about recruiting. This, this is, remember, this, you've already recruited people. They're in your environment. You're looking at what kind of person is going to be your leader. Okay? These are people, you remember, Jesus, we're studying the, the leadership principles of Jesus. Now, for the benefits of this seminar, what you think about Jesus from a religious or a spiritual standpoint is immaterial for the purposes of this seminar. History, history, apart from all of that, clearly teaches that Jesus was one of the great leaders of all history. Okay? Now, I have my own personal beliefs, but for the purposes of the Primarica Seminar here, we're looking at the principles of his leadership. Jesus worked with the multitudes, and then Jesus had a following of 120, and then he had a, 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 inside of that a group of 70, and then he had a group of 12, and inside that group of 12 he had three, and he worked with those different elements in different ways. He was very intimate with Peter, James, and John. And then the other nine were his disciples. He was very, very strong. And then he had the group of the other group that he ministered to. So this is not this is not when you're recruiting. My Lord would never recruit anybody. <laughs> but this is that you got people in your environment. The Bible said when Jesus was ready to pick his disciples, he went up on the mountain and he prayed all night long. He was looking for certain characteristics because he was going to pour his life into these people to become his duplicates, to become his leader. So one is spiritual minded. Uh, spiritual minded. That doesn't mean the person has to be a Christian. Don't, don't, go, don't go and call John and say, Bill Stewart taught us something right in America and said, to be a leader in America, you've got to be a Christian. You gotta... No, hey, that's not. Spiritual minded means there's more to life than just material things. People are more important than things. Relationships are more important than the house you live in or the car you drive. That's what I'm talking about there, okay? Now, you can be spiritual minded beyond that, but this is what I'm talking about. People that don't believe there's value to people beyond the materialistic are not going to treat people very good. So we want leaders that have strong spiritual values. We want leaders with deep convictions. You tell me what I need to believe to be successful and I'll believe it. If that changes tomorrow, I'll change my beliefs. No. Your beliefs don't change. If I've got to do so, I've never, in the 35 years I've been in primary care, I've never, ever, 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 ever been asked or even had an intimated that I would have to do something uh, that violated my value system to be successful in primary. Teachable. Teachable. Mike Tuttle grew up in d deep south Mississippi. I grew up in deep southeast Texas. I loved his saying is, you can't teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time and it irritates the pig. <laughs> You cannot make somebody be teachable. But there's a lot going on. How do you identify people that are teachable? They keep showing up. They show up for more things. They're hungry. They're wanting to learn. That doesn't mean the person who doesn't, we'll talk about that later, that doesn't mean the person who's not showing up for everything is a bad person. It just means they're not ready to be moving to leadership yet. Okay? New is objective. A leader, the person that you're going to bring into your leadership circle, is somebody that knows why they're here. They know their objective. A lot of people come in from America, they don't really know their objective. I don't know if you caught this on my video, but I think it's profound. In the early years of this business, we didn't recruit people with part-time income. We recruited them to RBP. It's real. I see a lot of that right now. People, hey, would you like to make $500 a month extra income? Hey, recruit them. Would you like to own your own business? Would you like to be, be your own boss, own your own business, run your own company? Okay, I can show you how to get started on that track part-time. You sell the big vision, and then you bring it down and show you how you can start it. $500 a month part-time income is not going to motivate somebody when they find out how much hard work it is. 
hey, I can do that on my credit card and I don't even have to work for it. I can get that extra $500 on my credit card and I don't even have to work on it. In five years from now, I'll file bankruptcy and start all over. You know? So, so understand that. New is objective. Build relationships. In this business, if you're going to be a leader, you've got to be able to build relationships. Again, please understand, this is not a test for who you recruit. Our doors are open wide. If you don't have a felony and you're a reasonably good person, come on in. Because we're going to help you become a better person. These are for leaders, okay? Now the method, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the Apostle Paul talks about building a movement. And he said, told Timothy, the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses teach the faithful men who will teach others also. So the plural of that word there implies groups. You build leaders through small groups. Not just one-on-one. -on -one. You have one-on-one -on -one relationships, but you have leadership groups. The question is, who gets in your leadership group? That's a more intimate time with the leader. Okay, Multiplication, not addition. Three who get three who get three. You know, the whole deal is built on multiplication. Okay. Um, four qualifications of my business. Well, let me just run through that multiplication. Because you know, we all know it. For instance, if you, find, if you can find three people in three months... And then the next, those people could find three people in three months. At the end of six months, you'd have 12 people on your team. If those people found three, you'd have 27. And then the year, you'd have 81 at the 12 months. So that'd be a total of 120 people. Well, by the time you got to the end of the year, about 60 of those 120 would have already quit, right? So that would leave you about 60 left over. And if you take the numbers that John says are the numbers, 15% times 2.2, he just said if you just average all over, 15% of the people in your team will produce, they'll average 2.2 sales per month, and that'll be your production, that would be $16,000 base shop in one year. Could you live with that? Yes. That'd only be $120,000, $130,000 income. Even a regional manager doing that now would be close to $100,000 a year as a regional leader. Okay, four qualifications. When I'm talking to people, I say, by the way, there's four things I'm looking for. Number one, to believe in what we do. Believe in what we do. Number two is integrity because we deal with people's money, and I always illustrate that this way. I said, you know what? You need to look at what, and I use that to leverage the appointment for the, uh, for the FNA. You need to sit down and look at what we do. We need to do an FNA for you, because if you don't believe in what we do and you have integrity, you wouldn't want to do it, right? I don't know how much money I can pay you. Because if you look at me and say, I don't care what you do, whether I believe it or not, if you'll pay me enough, I'll do it. That just tells me you don't have any integrity. Mm -hmm. So... And I said, then on the other side, I've got to do a background check. So integrity's got to come from both sides of the table. You've got to bring integrity, but if I do a background check and find out you don't have integrity, I can't let you do it. So then we just meet in the middle on that. The third thing is, is uh, desire. Desire's like fuel in a vehicle. We have a little car dealership right down the road from our office, and I always use this illustration. I say, if I took you down to Pollard Ford down here, and I said, pick out any car on the lot, it's yours, I'm giving you the keys. Yeah, it's yours, I'm giving it to you. Here's the key. If it doesn't have a drop of fuel in it, it won't get you off a lot. What I've shown you here today is the greatest business vehicle in America. The fuel is your desire. If you don't fuel this vehicle with your desire, it won't get you out of our parking lot. So you've got to figure out what it is you want in life that this vehicle will help you get. Okay, and then the fourth thing is work ethic. Got to be willing to work hard. Nothing in life worth having comes without working hard. In spite of what you might see on infomercials when you're awake at 3 o'clock in the morning because you hate your job and you can't sleep because you know you've got to go back to it tomorrow. And you're watching infomercials and they're promising all this free, easy money. The only people getting the free, easy money are the people running the infomercial. I always use this I said, you know what, even in America today, if you're going to be a successful thief, you got to work hard because there's a lot of competition. <laughs> and that always, you know, I just learned a long time ago, if you can kind of get people to laugh with you a little bit, it breaks down a little bit of the barriers and stuff. Those are the four things that I talked about. In, uh, in, in um, what kind of, you know, what we're looking for in our business. Okay, we're going to take a break here in a little bit, but not right at the moment. <laughs> By the way, you're independent contractors, and you know, we're going to take you to stand up stretch break. I mean, if we let a group like this lose, we'd be 30 minutes getting everybody back. If you need to take a personal break, take it, you take it, you're an independent contractor. We're going to take a stand up stretch, we're going to take a stand -up stretch break here in a minute. This, you know, when you buy a book, when you have a book sometimes, it's like, whoa, whoa, man, this one chapter is worth the price of the whole book. I mean, it was all good, but this is the chapter. This is it right here. This is the chapter. Relational thinking versus terminal thinking. Um, 
And we'll talk about that because people in our culture are not told to think uh, relationally. They just turn them out. I get an education because I've got to have an education. I go do this. Relational thinking is relating every activity to the accomplishment of your purpose and mission. Relating every activity to the accomplishment of your purpose and mission. I don't go to the grocery store to get food. I go to the grocery store to get a prospect, and while I'm there, I get milk and bread. <laughs> I don't go to the gas station to fill up my truck with diesel. I go to the gas station to prospect the guy on the next pump, and while I'm there, I'll get some diesel. I don't go to the auto parts place to get a part for my truck. I go there to prospect somebody working there, and while I'm there, I'll get my auto parts. I didn't go to the last time I was here, I didn't go to the Sonic to get a hamburger. I went to the Sonic to prospect the waiter, and while I was there, I got a hamburger. See, that's relating to every activity to the accomplishment of your objective. And so, uh, we'll talk about that.